This is PodKit, episode 45, Gritability, on Sunday, January 27th, 2019. And now, we're tired of Les's sass. This episode of PodKit is hosted by Brandon Johnson, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Rampersat. This episode has show notes at thenexus.tv slash pk45. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hey. Welcome to PodKit. We're back, and we're kind of on schedule. Wow, look at that. Two, what is this, two episodes in the same month? Yeah, yes. that's, like, unheard of. Not, e- not even two episodes in the same year, the same month. Yeah. That's amazing. Throw, throwing back to 2015. Wow, this our, is good. Our average is pretty great now. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. I think we start every episode talking about how long it's been since <laughs> the previous one. That's you true. Know, that's part of the gimmick now. It is. Yeah. It's the thing. It's part, part of the thing. Yeah, it's a good good thing to have a gimmick, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so last episode we talked about some stuff about... Does anybody remember what we talked about last episode? All sorts of things. We talked about... Um, we talked about uh, the developer experience for, like, uh, um, open source frameworks and how... Uh, I, th- I think our title was even Maintainer Did Advocate. Yeah, um, sure was. We talked about kind of the dual role of um, open source maintainers and how they kind of uh, serve as developer advocates um, for the stuff that they make. And sometimes we view them that way, and other times uh, other times we don't. But, like, the... the um, you know, and we also talked about some folks who we thought did that really well, and um, some other situations that we felt maybe uh, could have benefited from having a different... Ha- having this kind of maintainer-as-advocate frame. Um that's the biggest thing I remember from last episode. Yeah, sums up uh, my memory too. It's a good one. Uh, we, of course, we had to uh, remember our great interactions with Dan. Yeah, that was pretty surreal. I must yeah, admit, it was, it was pretty. Uh... Twitter was on fire that morning. <laughs> yes, that's a interesting way to start a Monday for sure. Sure was absolutely. Uh, and so last time we ran out of time to talk about some stuff, so we moved it to this episode. So hey, that's what this episode is. Do you want to hear about grids? I do. Grids are great. Grids are great. Uh, so, Brian, you've played with grids a little, a little bit, a few times, a little bit. Um, like I fixed some old IE eleven implementation of grids. And yeah, I don't know. If, I don't know if that counts. I've used Bootstrap Grid, which <laughs> is not CSS Grid. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I've used CSS Grid now, and um, it's pretty cool, but still fairly somewhat confusing actually right uh, you know no, nothing is simpler than the good old-fashioned days of clear left and i mean float left and float right and clear both yep. nothing beats yep. that right um so i wish i could actually show you the uh code pen that i did my mock-ups in but uh a few weeks ago when i had some more free time uh i was designing the back end you know the admin tool of the the cms for the nexus and um I wanted to have a nice sidebar that could collapse and stuff. And then in mobile, it would be collapsed, but you could open it and it would kind of be like half of the viewport wide. Um, right. And so like grids can actually help you do a lot of those things because um, CSS grids lets you, instead of just being like in a 2D fixed, all of the elements go in this one direction, either left to right, right to left, or up and down or down to up. You can actually have a sort of a 2D layout And not only that, you can also have it referenced by name. So you can do like header, 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 sidebar, main, 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 and so on. And then sidebar, footer, footer, footer. Um, And you can make a shape of the web page with these little named cells, which is sort of... It's pretty wild. Really an interesting syntactical choice on their part, I think. Totally. But it it doesn't leave room for confusion. It doesn't. It's super clear to see, oh, this is what this is supposed to do. It's extremely verbose in in kind of in a good way, I guess. Right. Um, so I did all of that, and y- y- one of the things that I realized is you – the biggest limitation that I ran into is that you can't animate the sh- the, the, the shape change of grids. Right. So, like, imagine you have your sidebar on a page, and then you want it to animate shut. Well, you can't go from, like, sidebar is there to no sidebar is there. Right. There's no way to animate that because you're you're changing states from – sidebar main 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 to main 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 yeah 
Uh, and so that's one of the weird limitations of grids. It's not a, a big deal, but it's interesting anyway. Um, I'll link here to some of the resources in the show notes um, that I use to do some of this stuff. And then later, if I can find my mock-up on CodePen, um, I will put that in there too. Uh, one of the big, de- you know, interesting parts about grids is there's so much flexibility even though it's not Flexbox, that's funny. Um, <laughs> gridability. There's so much gridability that it's almost overwhelming because you almost don't need, like, the f- you need the first 20% of this to get started. Um, and I'm, I'm referencing here the CSX, CSS Tricks Complete Grid Guide, and it is just overwhelming, just impossibly dense. Um, but it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that I have linked here is a little template generator. So it's 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 somebody built this in a little code pen, which is cool alone. But on the side, you can put in your little placeholder names, uh, your your cell names, and then it'll generate the grid shape for you visually, so that you can see what it would look like. And then you can take the the little you know name quoted things. And go put that in your own grid code, and now you've got your template. Like, that is it. You did it. Right. Super cool. Big fan. So that that's kind of sort of the initial experience with grids. Like, overall, it works really well. Um, there were a few weird quirks, like getting the header to be sticky. Right. And then float over the sidebar of the railway and then just collapse the sidebar and stuff. Like, some things are weird, but it's it for the most part, it works. Right on. That pretty well matches my experiences with Grid, too. I've used Grid on some personal stuff, and then um, for work, a couple client projects have used Grid. And um, the interesting thing is, uh, in a lot of situations, I, was ju- I wasn't I was really using the named template yeah. sort of thing. I was just using the, uh, what is it, uh, like the, the, the template cutouts. row and template yeah. column. Yeah, the cutouts. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's kind of magical sometimes how you know regardless of what approach you're using just how easily it seems to come together but i agree with you that like once you want to start animating that stuff it gets very tricky yeah it's not as um so like flexbox it reflows sort of naturally and grids don't feel so reflowing i guess absolutely well i think like the the design behind each you know a flex is like just the name is inherently fluid and so it's you know designed to say variable number of things let's just kind of like let it kind of lay Do out however it needs, it, it needs. Yeah. yeah and grid is more like a rigid this is how the layout is locked into and should behave and right it's kind of like creating the bounds that the rest of the app will dynamically flow into yeah i ag- yeah. i agree it's it's uh it'll take some getting used to for sure um have you either of you seen any uh, grid usage in the broader wild? Um, I mostly know of things that I've worked on. <laughs> does that uh, count? <laughs> yeah, it does, which it does. uh, doesn't really count. No. Um, so I guess the answer to your question is no. I don't know what I have seen. Only, only one place at an internal tool at my work that um, was written when the spec was still in draft and. Only IE 10 and 11 supported that spec. Aye. And then when Real Grid came out, it didn't support the new one. And the new one was not compatible with the old one. Of course yeah. not. Why would it be? Why would it be? Um, I also have not seen any grids out in the wild, unfortunately. One of the reasons I'm asking is because I think at this point, especially with IE signal, I mean Edge signaling that they're they're done trying and they're going to just switch to Chromium anyway. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like the grid possibilities are getting pretty high now. Um, especially for some of the time saved in the development cycles versus you know having to deal with legacy flexbox issues or even worse legacy old you know float grids um yep. i'd be interested to, to seeing if anybody makes a or tries to make a you know css framework out of css grids totally um, that does some more decoration and some more like syntactical sugar kind of stuff should keep an eye out for that for sure we will definitely do that and so uh brandon is going to talk about some uh some some design things and then i'll talk about some design things 
Yeah, sure. Um, so it's kind of kind of funny because uh, I kind of intended this to be a uh, a little bit of a reaction to what you were going to say about semantic UI and semantic UI React. I cheated. But I think that's okay. You cheated, and that's that's all right. That's all right. Um, so, like, uh, I guess maybe this is a way to frame it. Um, I'll, Framer. Uh, everyone's yeah. I'll frame it with Framer, and then uh, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll go from there. A lot of people ask me about um, what. Uh, my preferred React UI framework is. And you say Material um, UI, right? Oh, goodness gracious, no. Um, <laughs> I've, I've been anti-Material since before Material UI was a thing. The, the React framework Material UI, not the spec, of course, because how could I be against something that didn't exist? That'd be weird. Um, but uh, basically, you know, Material UI and... Uh, you know, that, that's basically really the only game in town, it sounds like, from what people think of. People, um, but, only, like, when you Google React design framework, oh, I'm pretty sure you don't get what you're about to talk to, talk about. Ex- exactly, you don't Excuse get... Excuse me, I use React Bootstrap. That's right, there's Sometimes. also React Bootstrap. Okay, I, I, I don't know if I call <laughs> that's that... That's kind of a different thing. It is kind of a different thing, but it's hard to... Can you think of the difference? Like, I know we know the difference, but what's the term, the terminology difference? You know, I don't know. I don't know that there is a good one, and I think that's kind of part of the problem. So, like, because, this is, like, to me, this is a component framework, and Bootstrap is just a library. Like, it's a CSS it's like library, a CSS library. Yep. that has JavaScript integration with React. Yep. Um, so, like, the I think definitely the way to think about these next two things I'm going to talk about is that they're kind of like component libraries for sure um, that have style comp- like style. Styles are part of it. CSS is part of it. Yep. Um, JavaScript is part of that. But they're both kind of intrinsically linked to React and couldn't really be used without React. Um, and uh, those, those two kind of uh, component libraries or, com- or frameworks that um, I'm about to talk about are Ant Design, which came out of Alibaba, and Blueprint.js, which is a project of Palantir. Not Palantir, the uh, Drupal folks out of Chicago, the super doomsday, um, dystopic kind of uh, Peter Thiel Palantir. Um, but hey, I don't know. It's really well designed and it's free. So, uh, you know, I've, I've not going to lie, I've used Blueprint before. It's actually pretty all right. Um, but, I, you know, kind of like Ryan said, um, Ant Design in particular, uh, but Blueprint as well, they're, they're both react component framework so the way you interact with basically everything is either with a css class that you put on a react component or you actually import the component and use it in your um in in your application itself now like with ant design it's almost always you know like i would almost always import an ant design component because part of part of what you're getting there is like uh people's work that already follows the kind of conventions that you'd imagine with a react app so with ant design you get things that are really easy to integrate with um you know whatever sort of like uh global store you want to use so like for example i'm a big fan of the form components in ant design because they are set up to interact really well with redux even though ultimately you can use them with any sort of state management solution that that you might imagine that you might imagine you'd use in redux you can use it with context you can use it with um, I don't know what's the other cool one that people really like. Unstated, I think that's another yep. one that people like. Mm-hmm. Um, if 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 for some reason you like ang- your Angular and your React, you can use MobX or whatever um, <laughs> stuff like that. Um, but uh, ultimately, I think the thing that sets sets Ant Design and Blueprint apart from things like React Bootstrap is because they kind of thought about the data side to a lot of this. Um, and you know, I've used both, and I like them a lot. Um, you know, clearly, uh, you know, ethically, neither of these companies are uh, super great. Uh, uh, Alibaba, with it being uh, a super gigantic retail thing, and also, um, you know, the, the other kind of components of being a unit of Alibaba or a, an Alibaba project, and Palantir, with like its very obvious um, ties to some not great stuff. Um, with the U.S. government and with other governments and the kind of, you know, uh, AI and machine learning-assisted surveillance state things, 
Um, but uh, p- part of why they have this stuff is because um, they have a lot of designers and they have a lot of really talented designers and they have a lot of really talented developers too, um, which is kind of, you know, why I think as far as the code goes, um, like it, it's both of these are pretty high quality frameworks. Yeah, for sure. I've been clicking through Ant Design and it's slick. There's a ton of components here for a lot of different use cases. And yeah, I this looks like an awesome API to use. The, yeah, they're both really encyclopedic. There's not really anything that feels like, oh, I can't do that with this. There have been some situations, especially earlier on, where like um, I would have been like, oh, well, this is fine, but I want to create a custom component anyway. Um, but uh, over time, I found that really ultimately... Um, basically you just have to kind of slightly reframe how you're thinking about a certain input or a certain, a certain UI element, and you can pretty easily use whatever they have, um, to build something out. So like if you have a, a, a form item that needs to have like a, I don't know, what do you, what do you think? Like if you have a form item where like the, the form value on like the form state, you can kind of think of it that way as like an object and you have to have multiple properties on it. Right. What you, what you can do is you can just wire together two other form elements and like if it if it has like you know if this form item has um an object as its value you just wire those up so that it it writes to the form state um kind of in tandem like that and it uses the same sort of syntax that you'd be used to with like um set state in react in order to make that work so it's 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 pretty darn slick i'm a pretty big fan of ant design in particular but blueprint blueprint as well i like that it, it includes things like tags or like a timeline and statistic um you know these these components that you normally wouldn't find in a component library and then they've created it and so it's already there you don't have to build that and manage how it looks compared to everything else and things like a type ahead or um you know collapsing just nice things that you would otherwise struggle to make work or have to reskin another library it's already included and there for you yeah absolutely i think part of it has to has to do with just how data driven both these companies are um right that like uh you know you need you need to be able to to um to share those components uh in order for their their applications to work as is. So why wouldn't they be a part of their framework? But I think unlike so many other companies that have sponsored frameworks like this in the past, it's kind of a, a different sort of, uh, a different sort of ball game when you, when you're dealing with these, um, data driven kind of enterprises. So, uh, Ryan, with all that said, what do you think about semantic UI? Yeah. So, uh, for some reason I decided to use semantic UI for the CMS stuff. Um, I don't know why I didn't pick Ant or um, I didn't. I mean, I've I've known about Blueprint, but I wouldn't have picked Blueprint. But I don't know why I didn't pick Ant. Yeah. Um, there was some something happened in Ant like three months ago that everybody was up in arms about. I don't remember what it was anymore. I don't remember it either. So uh, that 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 makes two of us. It must have blown over like within the week. You know how things are. Right. Um. So so semantic UI is very similar to the the concept here. So it's it's more of a complete full component library there's css involved but the feature here is that it has javascript to do stuff with it so it's interactive and it and it's componentized so this is sort of a more classical one though because the the baseline semantic ui is just css and flavored with some jquery garbage nobody likes jquery anymore so what do you do well you go over to the uh, react flavored version instead right um and so the react flavored version is available um and so you know i what what version is stable in ant design that's a good question it's probably something ridiculous looking admittedly i don't peek all that often at the package version oh, for it it's 3.13 it like sure enough so that sounds like a stable version right and so sounds like it <laughs> in semantic ui react the stable version is today 0.84 so it's not even oh, a 1.0 nice. release and that's Semver. that's very sad um so you know it, it kind of just you, you take what you can get um you know as far as the components go most of them are pretty good 
Uh, you know, all the buttons are good. You know, they have props that do stuff. It's built in TypeScript internally, so everything has Yay. real types. And, and, and design and blueprint also are TypeScript. Oh, fact. That's, that's wonderful. Right? Um, Is the new CMS in TypeScript? Not yet, because you're going to help me with that. All right. Uh, that's right. Um, yeah, like, like there's a lot of good, good stuff in here, and I, I love having a bunch of stuff just pre-built for me. So, for example, I love having the capability of just pulling in uh you know a, a nice um like collapsing menu that's cool that's great love it uh all of the logic for you know the media queries are taken care of and i don't have to deal with it anymore i love having the ability just to pull in a nice little uh, autocomplete search box kind of thing yeah um and i love having to guess though about how its internal components work because that's always perfect fun. sounds um, great Sounds great, and, and and so, but being being a point eight four library, you know, it's not too bad. Um, so I guess I guess I don't have a problem with it. I think it's pretty good. It certainly offers much more rapid development than say something like just plain Bootstrap or React Bootstrap, um, because this lets you actually build stuff that's very common in a, especially in. Um, you know, like an admin view. So like, you know, forms, some autocompletes, and that might cross over to some kind of like internal user site. Um, this would not be very useful probably for like a front page or, you know, the 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 front of house, I guess you could call it. It looks like it's more meant for like, yeah, form Internals. kind of admin tools, internal stuff, yeah. some comments. So it's it's a little bit less heavy handed. Yeah. I just I also like its default theme. It looks pretty good overall. There's some there's some color, but not too much color. It's not there's nothing like it's also it's, not material. Yeah, it's very it's very kind of plain, which is it's a good default to have for you know non opinionated frameworks. And I think they support theming. Yes, so, they do. And it and it actually um, yeah. it has more than one theme by default, which is nice. Um, and it's also not material. Yeah. Bad materials, bad. No, none of that. Well, it's um, semantic. The the, <laughs> the the funniest part about the whole thing here is though, it uses less as its yeah style thing, and, and design that, does too. And and I just like, but everybody knows that less lost. Why are we doing this still? Right. Yeah. Less is more. Yeah, it seems that way. Sass is it seems more. Seems that way. <laughs> yeah, I'm tired of less is sass. To be honest. <laughs> I bet. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the thing about it is like that, that was actually a really big deal. Um, sometimes when folks were looking at using ant design, because, uh, you know, in some situations people want to compile the, the raw styles, the less styles, uh, into their app, but ant also ships with compiled styles, which like seems like almost always the better option, especially if you're using something like create react app where you don't have configuration access to the to the style sheets so like i i I haven't found a good reason yet for folks to compile the less on their own but it seems like for whatever reason that's kind of still considered to be the default way to do it with ant Um, well i would say um you would want to compile the less or the sass if you're theming it so you provide a bunch of variables and then you import their library totally but i think that's why like a ui framework should export compiled version by default and then maybe expose on another path their source so you can you can override it and do th- other things with it if you would like to. That is kind of the wild thing, though. I, I don't believe, especially for Blueprint, I don't believe there's like any sort of theming system whatsoever. I think it's just you get what you get hmm. um, and have to override it with, you know, the the, the quote-unquote usual way with, you know, bang One important. million level deep selectors. Exactly, exactly. Extremely specific selectors with bang important and, yeah, which... Yeah. Style equals. It's bad. It's bad. <laughs> yeah. But so it goes. Yeah. So uh, have you have you seen in the wild uh anybody using like uh like any of these things like like other than what you've worked on Brandon because I know I know that's what you were about to say. Yeah. <laughs> um I guess I haven't seen anything using ant myself except that one time on Hacker News when somebody was going crazy about it. Um I yeah I've I've heard of it but I haven't used it I haven't seen anyone use it really maybe I've I've used websites that use it but I haven't really known it I feel like I have seen places use ant I can't mention what they are because I don't know them 
but I feel like I have I've been like, oh yeah, this is probably ant design. Um, I well, I mean, say, it's like it's yeah. like all the sites you see with Bootstrap. You just kind of like, I think this is Bootstrap. Yeah, it could be somebody emulating Bootstrap. It could be somebody going in and copying some styles out of Bootstrap and putting them into another website. Um, no comment. No comment there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, I'll make I'll make a continuity joke here. So. Perfect. So we're, this is this is PK forty five, and this is currently uh, January twenty seventh. And so yesterday I recorded with Matt episode three of In Boot Camp, a new show here at the Nexus, and uh, he is learning Bootstrap in his uh, boot camp right now, and and it's really fun when he's learning Bootstrap because like you know like everybody's used bootstrap for like years like ever since bootstrap 2 everybody's been using bootstrap and so now he's just started learning flexbox a little bit and the bootstrap nice. way and so it's, he's it's, using bootstrap 4 at least yes he is good yep and i don't know how much detail they'll go into on like actual flexbox because it 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 can take a long time to be overwhelmed it, it's it takes a long time and it's a little overwhelming to see all those properties and i talk about this on the show in that in that third episode but the funny part is episode episode three of in boot camp hasn't come out yet episode zero will be launching soon so the continuity joke here is that that show is so behind there you go <laughs> i gotcha well that's all right I, it's I behind in the future feels. behind in the future from the past just like Truly. every other show we do. Wait, we've 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 had a title like that before. Yes, because I say it every time from the past and the future. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, that feels like a that feels like some words about UI frameworks. I think so. UI I feel is good. good about those words. Same. Yeah. They're they're very wordy. Sometimes sometimes users need to interact with things and to do so they use interfaces. Just why they're called user interfaces. End chapter. So uh, I guess we have a couple other things to talk about here. I don't know how how long we actually want to spend on it, but we yeah, very we put briefly some, just just we to put say some I'm... tweets. Yeah, um, and basically what it burn uh, what it comes down to, uh, Freudian slip is that burnout is a thing. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you've heard about this, but um, burnout it's a it's a thing that happens, especially in tech, but I think in basically every field, academia anything um professional anything and, and surely anything we whatsoever. hear about it more because we're also in tech and we also exactly. follow everybody else on twitter and we have friends in the business in the industry oh yeah so i'm sure we hear about our own problems more on average. absolutely well and like the other part to it as well is that um you know working in tech comes with this uh you know extreme capability of being able to kind of like introspect on sh- on stuff like this where like um, you're, you're lucky you're one of those introspectors there's yeah, also a lot of people in tech that don't even know what you just said that's true that's true um but uh you know this this is one tweet that we that of unknown origin that we track down um that reads uh pro tip to get stuff done and to get that stuff done well focus only on work when it's time to work but more importantly focus only on not work when it's time to not work and this reminded me of a thread that I had uh, between last episode and this episode where I quote tweeted a, a BuzzFeed piece um, about uh, about burnout and how burnout seems to be a very millennial thing. Um, and like, uh, you know, I think I've talked about this on the show a non-zero number of times. Um, but like uh, a thing that I often do, and I think a thing that a lot of people do um, is like, to relax from work i'll do other things that look an awful lot like work (laughs) right um you know for example i think we were talking in the fringe about how i was contributing to some like meetup group websites um guess what that's still work um and i and i did that happen to do that on a weekend um and i'm not getting which is also a time when you're not supposed to work exactly exactly yeah um but it's still it looks an awful lot like work you know for all of us it's it's a it's a troublesome thing that our hobby is also our job. Right. Yeah. Now, as someone who doesn't work outside of work very often, I would say when I do work on other work type things outside of work, so being, you know, poking around with web development in some way of any form, um, it's usually because it's that involves different tooling and frameworks and patterns than i do at work at work and so it's a way for me to kind of stay fresh and keep my mind going on things and i feel like 
I know I'm doing that for fun and it's not it I I categorize it differently especially because I don't do it as often so I feel like if I were more like the two of you and just doing things all the time maybe it would be different but I do for me it's more like a time planning thing I I I've been trying to do more on the weekends just to stay with it and try out new stuff but that hasn't been always very great yeah it comes comes in cycles for me so like some some periods of the year like i can actually just do less on the weekends right. and just not have to either actually work work or even like learn fun and do fun stuff for work kind of work right but then there are other times of the year where i'm just plugged in and busy the whole time yep yeah totally it's kind of, it's kind of like that for me too i think the other thing that i guess i maybe didn't do an adequate job of of explaining when i had that little intro to this section here is that like I think the thing that I've kind of discovered over the years is that um, a lot of times, like e- even if I'm like just programming to stay fresh or reading articles or papers or books to, to, to stay up to date with what's going on um, in uh, kind of what it means to be a software engineer and stuff like that, um, it's still like it's more or less the same cognitive act- activity that I do, you know, eight or so hours a day to get paid. Right. Um, yeah. And that it's the same cognitive activity is kind of like, ha, huh, especially in the years since I've graduated from college and don't really do, quote unquote, like education like activities, education, like formal education style learning. Uh, it's been really interesting to see how like uh, how um, just like when I was at the U, I still try to fill that time that I'm not doing something that I would consider productive with other things that are productive, just productive for different purposes or to different ends. Yep. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of this, this Twitter thread that I, that I posted the one from the one that I did, uh, quotes part of the Buzzfeed article where it talks about, you don't, you don't fix burnout by going on vacation. You don't fix it with anxiety baking or the Pomodoro technique or overnight oats, uh, which is pretty hilarious because I've definitely tried to alleviate burnout with all of those things. I don't. What does uh, overnight oats refer to? Uh, well, that's 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 funny because uh, we should have an entirely different podcast about uh, about oatmeal because I have lots of oatmeal opinions. <laughs> I um, see. Because so that's I'm, literally eating oats overnight, like at nighttime. And not like at night. It is um, before you go to bed. <laughs> You put some oats in a jar and you add some other things to the oats. You might add some chia seeds, some almonds, some uh, maybe some fruit, maybe, um, and then uh, some sort of uh, some sort of liquid, usually like uh, milk or cream, um, or if you have like yogurt, that's like um, not Greek yogurt, which is I don't understand why people would have non-Greek yogurt, but that's okay. Um, you add it into the you add it into the oats and you mix it around and you add some like maple syrup or honey or something to sweeten it and then you um, seal up the jar put it in the fridge and then the next morning voila you have oatmeal and it actually tastes very very good yeah that sounds um, really good actually yeah and it's like uh, it's pretty easy to do too and of course because you're still eating it cold um, there's not you don't really have to eat you don't have to heat it up at all um, and that is like a big thing for me especially as I've been working more from places that are not my house. Um, Grab and go. It's awesome to be able to have something that doesn't actually require a heat source. Um, because, and this kind of goes back to our Scotch guard conversation from, I think that might've been the fringe. Yes. Um, but I don't really like using microwaves anymore either. So, um, it's, it's kind of <laughs> nice to, um, to, uh, have something that doesn't really require a heat source whatsoever. So that's one oatmeal thing. I can talk about oatmeal all day. Um, but, but that's just one of them. I also have a really great recipe that I like for, um, steel cut oats, where, you know, usually I make them the night before anyway, but I usually have to heat those up. So I like to make those at home rather than uh, bringing it with me somewhere because, again, no more microwaves for this kid. So there you go. That is my oat interlude. Oat, oat, oat interlude? <laughs> oat, oh. oat interlude. Oh that's, my what we'll, that's what we'll call it for now. Um, yeah. Yes, indeed. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I guess like the, the core of what I'm trying to get at here is like... Um, there's there's probably some aspect of like how a lot of these sorts of the sort of conversation or discourse around burnout um is definitely not new with tech but for whatever reason we're talking about it more and um 
that's kind of interesting. And especially as I, you know, now that I'm in a, a different sort of work situation where, um, you know, managing, uh, managing my time is kind of, uh, differently defined and differently important. Um, you know, that's, uh, that's some stuff that, uh, I'm trying to think about now. I've definitely gotten better at, um, compartmentalizing work and non-work work. Um, and I think that's kind of the, the, that's kind of a start of that. But I think the thing that's even better is to get to the point where, um, like that first tweet says, I'm not working when I'm not working and I'm working when I'm working. But actually one other thing to that, to that regard, I, uh, I recently removed a bunch of Slack workspaces from my work computer and removed a bunch of work Slack workspaces from my cell phone and from my, um, personal laptop. Um, and it's pretty awesome because now whenever I want to talk about, you know, something funny or something, something wacky, um, I just do that through my phone and I know I'm never going to get pinged about work through my phone on Slack. Um, and that's kind of a pretty awesome net positive there. Yeah. Being able to tune out completely is, is nice. I, I opt to not have my work stuff on my phone other than Slack because, um, I don't want emails and stuff that I don't really care about or need to look at or want to look at while I'm not at work, but also they, you know, Microsoft exchange and remote access, your remote wipe stuff. Yeah. I don't want to give no my company spyware. access to that. Yeah. But, um, for Slack, I do use it outside of work on, you know, times when we're meeting up outside of work and if not everyone has their, you know, phone number of, of everyone. And so sometimes Slack is just nice to quick send a message there. And I've used that several times for that reason. Yep. I'm the same but. way. I have my work Slack I don't have Microsoft Teams, though, which mm. is the official work communication on my phone, because you also have to have your uh, enterprise Exchange spyware stuff. on my phone, which I refuse right. to have, because it's my phone, not your phone. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I used to work at a place where Slack was basically used entirely for kind of um, that sort of thing. It was basically the engineering team's, like, um, you know, break room of sorts, right? Um, and other teams too, but that was like the, the main purpose of it. So because of that, I didn't mind having my work Slack on there, but nowadays almost all my work Slacks are directly with clients and stuff like that. And I just don't want people to have that level of access to me. Yeah, um, I think that's totally fair. Yeah. As a, as a contractor who works with a bunch of different people, I would say your, your new approach is by far a better one. It's already when you, when paid you, dividends over the past, like three days that I've, <laughs> that I've had it, which that's is pretty great. great. Yeah. When you work at like a company like Ryan or I, then it's I think more understandable to be a little more connected. Totally. I, I wish I could be a little bit less connected sometimes though. That annoying little red dot. I can't get yeah. rid of it. It it's always somewhere and I see it and I hate it. You can mute and you won't get a notification, but the red dot's the still, red dot's goes still there. there. Yep. I need a like superior mute, ultra mute, whatever it takes to get that red dot. Oh, you know what I can do? I can edit the source code of the Slack client and, <laughs> there and you go. De-st- I can display none of the dot because I hate that dot. Yep. That's the approach. That's the approach. Yeah. I, you know, we were about to end and go on to our favorite section, but that reminds me, do you want to briefly talk about that crazy Slack logo? Yeah, sure. Let's talk about it. Um, I remember when this happened, I was actually, um, I actually thought, you know, it, it, when the logo changed over, it looked like one of those like old fashioned Windows adware things where like somebody installed a bad Chrome extension and all of a sudden the Chrome logo changes because they installed a malicious Chrome, Chrome extension. Yeah. Um, it kind of flickered back and forth and I was like, what's happening? Um, it was, it was pretty weird. How did you guys experience it? Uh, I think I saw it on Hacker News first, and oh. then I then I clicked through to the, you know, Slack blog, and I'm like, wow, that doesn't achieve any of the things you just said. Right. I was uh, at Code Freeze that day, so I was yeah. kind of AFK all day, and I saw on Twitter, oh, Slack logo updated, cool, and then I remembered to look about it, look at it the next day, so everything had like propagated through, and it was fine. Um. I'm a fan of their new icon, especially in the sense of, like, app icon on, like, my dock. Yeah. Or on my iPhone, because the old one wasn't really a logo. It was, like, a weird 
zoom in of their logo with an S in the middle. And I was never a fan of that. It didn't really make sense to me. So I think this is a little more consistent and uniform. Sure. Now that that purple background is kind of strange. I I would argue that on desktop it should be less dramatic and right. more maybe just the shape with a shadow or something and use that transparency and things. But I don't know. Yeah. I I think the the new Slackbot logo is a little strange. Totally. Um, I have a bunch of design, uh, and like agency type analysis of this but uh i don't don't know whether like i could i could talk about that for literally hours unfortunately um so i'll (laughs) I'll boil it down i'll boil it down to a couple of quick things um so the the company that slack hired to do this is the company that everybody hires to do their identity design it's a company called pentagram out of new york city um actually technically i think they're out of london but the u.s office is in new york city and and they've done some really great work in the past and they've also done some um really less great work um and more recently it feels like they've been just straight up striking out um they did the identity for um nicolette mall down here which is literally an n with a space in the middle of the end so that it looks like an arrow going north and an arrow going south um and like Mm. i found that particularly kind of rotten because um you know on nicolette mall we have identity design agencies who would actually you know uh you know give something that that had like i don't know local meaning or any meaning whatsoever um, yeah if you're in a big city you should use a local you know design firm or you know advertising agency i definitely think absolutely um you know and they also did the uh they also did the uh the metropolitan museum of art in new york that was like often lampooned um it's like totally like it's just the the letters for the met and they're all kerned together, so they look really wacky and don't really make any sense or reflect basically anything about what the museum is or did. And this Slack thing is just kind of another in a long line of kind of mediocre um, kind of uh, kind of things there. Um, so, like, if you look at their book, you'll see that they get some really high-profile work. And they should because they're, I think, generally they're very competent, competent people. And, like, when I say that... Um, you know, I feel like they've been striking out more recently. That's really just a, you know, kind of one person's view. But I think in a lot of situations, you know, if it, when you look at some of this stuff, you see some of the more controversial logos over time, like the Library of Congress, where it literally just has library. And then depending on where they are in, um, <laughs> depending on where they are uh, or what, what they want to refer to, um, I'll drop this link in here because it's it's pretty wild. They just put Library of Congress inside of it. It's just it's just kind of ridiculous. Um, and oh, they so did like, the Designed by Apple in California book. Sure did. Yeah. Um, but you know, for for all of my kind of maybe lukewarm criticism of those folks, um, ultimately um, they're one of the most kind of they're basically among the the foremost uh, identity design agency in the entire world. Um, and that's not without reason because um, they have some of the most competent um, and truly like well-respected identity design like partners uh, in the world as well. A thing that's kind of interesting about Pentagram and, their, and kind of the structure of the company um, is that like everyone who every pentagram partner so you can think of those as like executives almost um, there's like a like they're all kind of equal partners in the company um, so like they started with five which is why they called it pentagram uh, and from there they've kind of expanded in much the same way that like I, like when I've thought about starting like a creative tech firm I've want to do basically the exact same thing you have just like a small handful of, of equal partners in the company and then you add additional people kind of as as people mature to the level of being a partner and then you have those people bring on the kind like the 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 people who do the kind of work that you want to see the company doing and then as those people kind of um, grow up and mature as as developers you kind of bring them in to run the company and then you can retire right um as far as things go it's 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 like a really kind of interesting way to run a design firm um but that said, you know, sometimes it's just been kind of disappointing to uh, to look at uh, some of their 
recent work and kind of how, um, well, it's been disappointing because the work has been disappointing. Um, but that said, you know, like any company, you're going to have a lot of things that are kind of mediocre or just okay. Or especially in a place that's as high profile as Pentagram, um, people are going to kind of criticize and make fun of it, um, for everything that they do. That's really good. Yeah. So that's my long winded design industry agency format uh criticism of the slack logo yeah um it makes sense that you're gonna have like hits and misses yeah it's gonna happen i I don't know this new slack logo it when you read the blog post about you know being simpler and being more consistent and everything like yeah there are it's smaller and there's more pieces and i just don't even know totally and, and and then on the purple background, like, half of the colors don't even make sense. Right. Uh, somebody on Twitter made an alternative-shaped logo of the previous version. So it's it's just, it, it uh, the colors, like, one of their major complaints was they had too many colors in the old one. Well, okay, we can fix that. Um, uh, another observation is that all popular companies will eventually have those four colors, you know, like... Yeah. A, green blue and a red and a yellow i just have to note um mark Arment of atp made a great shirt and or logo that is now a shirt for one day left as we record this so probably too late if you listen <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh it's a great version of the slack logo with uh cheese grater mac pros and the 2013 mac pro recreating a logo <laughs> because that podcast is known for their uh criticism of the mac pro yeah it's that's pretty awesome yeah uh wow what a thing um logos are hard um you know sometimes it's just not easy and sometimes you know you want to change your logo but there's no real direction to another one there's no like corporate milestone there's no vision and change there's nothing like nothing changed between old slack and new slack recently right Eh, new logo time no big deal right yeah we'll have another one another several years I don't know. I'd probably go back to the old one. Slack classic. Yeah, for real. <laughs> oh, goodness. Right. Well, I think it's probably about time for a new Twitter followers. Is that it true? Is, it is time. All righty. Well, um, mine is all about brands this week. Brands. Um, but yeah, br- brand on, on brand. Um, yep. So the first one is uh, something called Starcon, which is a software engineering conference out of Waterloo, Ontario, which sounded super fun. And I didn't get to go, but I saw a bunch of really good tweets out of there. And I kind of want to go next year because it combines my two favorite things, um, uh, introspective tech conferences that aren't just a bunch of technical talks, and um, Canada. So that's kind of fun. That makes sense to me. Yeah, Canada's pretty great. Uh, I should go back there one of these days. Um, Another thing I followed is something called the Beginner Dev, which is a kind of vertical of... um, uh the the what is this called dev.2 i don't know what the thing is called anymore but that's that's kind of the website dev community followed this website by is weird uh, female programmer male programmer emoji is their uh title for the website in based on the browser title bar oh it's the it used to be called the practical dev but yeah oh yeah it's, yeah. it's fine um but it's it the reason why I followed it is because um I kind of help out with the Minneapolis Junior Devs group and it's always interesting to know what kind of the sort of uh new developer discourse is even though I'm not junior by any stretch of the imagination any longer um it's just kind of a um an interesting kind of collation of that stuff um you know the practical dev is kind of a difficult um you know kind of like free code camp is um and you know some of those other medium blogs where like sometimes the quality kind of varies um but i think generally it's interesting to hear what people have to say about stuff like that so follow that to keep tabs on that sort of thing uh and last but not least is instabug a really cool um kind of bug reporting and crash reporting framework um that i use on some react native stuff and it's it's pretty magnificent um it's i've actually like it kind of better than uh Sentry and Fabric and some of the other crash reporting frameworks I've used in the past. It just kind of has a really comprehensive way of getting at things, and it seems like by default you get better um, and more comprehensive information than most other things. 
So that just about does it for me and my Twitter followees. How about you, Brian? Uh, I didn't follow too many people because it's only been three weeks. So yeah. luckily, um, not many. Uh, I followed React Minneapolis, the great React Minneapolis meetup from the local Twin Cities here. Um, I've been going to a few more of those recently. I've traditionally dabbled here and there every like six months, but I've gone to several in the last couple of months. Um, also, TypeScript Lang followed that during the fringe. Uh, I'm a I'm a TypeScript fan, so I should follow them. And their Twitter is not high traffic, so it's great. Basically, when they release new versions and have any big like, here's a useful thing. Here's a link. It's pretty awesome. Yep. And I followed no one. There you go. Also a good call. Classic. Classic yep. Ryan. Mm-hmm. So, um, what's, uh, what's coming up for you two? Oh, geez. Well, JavaScript MN is this week. Brian's going to be giving a lightning talk. Nice. Yeah, yeah. I have to finish that lightning talk. Yeah, TypeScript, probably at this point in the uh, realm of React. Though I'll touch on some TypeScript-isms, too. That's good. Very the good. main the main talk is going to be about React Native, and I've had like a non-zero number of people ask me, oh, are you going to be presenting the React Native talk? And I have a rule where I try not to, well, I guess it's not a rule. I have a guideline where I try not to present at meetups I help to organize. Um, yeah. Just because that feels weird and bad. It's, it's the, the manager's curse, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so like, you know, one potentially negative thing about that is like i feel like uh hey we, we have a lot of people signed up to attend we have almost 200 people rsvp Whoa, um, wow which is going to be a problem if it's a problem but we'll see it might not be um, it's also supposed to be a high of is it still minus 14 that day so minus 30 yeah. is what i read oh for the I'd low ha- i guess I'd it'll also imagine... be two days after a very large snowstorm so we'll see about that too yeah so we're just going to kind of assume that um when everything's kind of all told people will probably uh maybe uh you know not show up and it'll all be <laughs> yeah. fine i mean like 50 you know if, if we have like a 20 percent attendance rate we'll be just fine if we have a 50 percent right. attendance rate we'll be just fine if we have a 60 to 75 percent attendance rate which we'd have sometimes but not always that might be a little bit more of a problem but we'll figure it out yeah it's, it's a big company There's i uh room. i didn't I, I haven't read the sign up list um i did recommend um to some people at work so we have um as, as one of the things that we're trying at work is sort of we we recently did a hiring wave of like uh, boot camp grads and university grads yeah and so we've been training them up um you know we started with java um how did you spring you know um, we're, we're going through html and css this week going nice. through javascript and stuff um this coming week um, and then React the week after. And so I suggested that they uh, head over to the local JavaScript Minnesota meetup for free food and a great talk on React Native um, because that's one of the things we're not covering, but right. it is very interesting um, to, to know about. Totally. And I think it'll be good. I think basically in content, it seems to be very similar to the one that I gave at React Minneapolis that yep. I do have audio and video for, but I don't know that I want to post. <laughs> um, because yeah. you know it's it's difficult it's tricky um yep. but i'm ready for i'm ready for the next time i present it but i won't present it at my meetup i'm gonna have to present it somewhere else that is okay exactly um it should be pretty cool hope to see some folks out there um it, yeah it'll be it'll be really quite quite nice That's i think great. some coworkers of mine might might come this week or this month we'll see nice perfect well, where can we find you all on the internet or in real life? Uh, you can find me at a ton of places, but mostly in downtown Minneapolis. Um, uh, and if not downtown, sometimes in uptown, because I work there sometimes. Um, yeah, I know. It's, it's pretty wild. It takes a couple buses for me to get over there, but it's, it's quite nice nonetheless. Um, let's see. Uh, on the internet, I'm Brandon underscore MN. Uh, that's the same on Twitter, on Instagram, on Snapchat, on various other things that I can't remember the name of right now. Um, and my website, if you replace that underscore with a dot, brandon.mn, that's where you can find out more information about who I am, which would be, uh, you know, I don't know, could be of interest. Uh, otherwise I'll be drinking coffee till you see me next. That's a lot of coffee. That, that and or bread. I'll be drinking coffee and Mm. eating the bread to soak up the coffee so that I don't, um, you know, have caffeine problems it's the dynamic duo exactly 
What about you, Ryan? Well, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on Twitter at Ryan Amar, and of course on my website, RyanRampersad.com. And next weekend, you can also find me at the University of Minnesota for the Mini Hack Hackathon. Nice. Pretty sure that's what it's called. And I'll be there for the uh, mentoring sections at uh, Saturday and Sunday. So that'll be pretty fun. Pretty cool. Pretty magnificent. That sounds great. Mm hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, you can find me uh, hanging around in Minneapolis. You know, Uptown's kind of where I, I am. Um, you can find me on my website at brianm.me or follow me on Twitter at brianmitchl. Very good. Right on. Well, great. It was good Good. Good to see everybody in the same month again. Yeah. Good, good to record again in the same calendar year. Uh, hopefully we can do it. <laughs> hopefully we can do this uh, at least twice a month, uh, eleven more times. Yeah, that's that seems that seems doable. Eleven that's, more. It's a good goal. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Well, you can find uh, show notes for the episode at thenexus.tv slash pk45. You can also leave some comments and discuss it on our subreddit, which is reddit.com slash r slash thenexustv. And if you're liking what we're doing, uh, swing on over to patreon.com slash thenexustv. And if you do support us on Patreon, you can listen to The Fringe, where we talk about a bunch of things that you did not hear about here on the show. But we did kind of make reference to some of them, so uh, I guess if we want to get at that. The, mm. the Patreon is the way to get at that. Yep. Totally. Well, with that, have a good one. Have a good one. Bye. The Nexus, the Nexus, the Nexus TV podcasts from, from the, the technological, technological convergence. convergence.